good to go before we start. Right, so good evening, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 30th, and we have here on the Montana, Montana course tonight, uh, our lecturer is Preston Parrish, the State Tribal Policy Analyst for the Montana Budget and Policy Center. And I will have our student facilitators, Quinn Seibert and Savannah Thompson, introduce Preston in just a moment. And uh, so good evening, everybody. I'm really delighted to welcome folks to tonight's lecture by uh, Preston Parrish. And we have two students, Quinn Seibert and Savannah Thompson, who are gonna do the formal introductions. So if you guys wanna to go to the microphones and I will turn the webcams towards you. Is this on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Savannah Thompson, and for this plenary lunch, we are lucky to have Preston Parrish joining us. Preston has worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors on local, state, and national issues ranging from LGBTQ plus workforce equality and environmental justice to public health and education. Preston now serves as a state tribal policy anal analyst for the Montana Budget and Policy Center. There he analyzes the impacts of state budget and tax decisions on tribal communities and advocates for a progressive agenda that increases socioeconomic outcomes and opportunities for American Indians and tribal communities in Montana. Originally from Michigan, Preston grew up on an Indian reservation and is still a member of the Bay Mills Indian community. He holds a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan. Additionally, in 2019, he was named a Victory Empowerment Fellow by the LGBTQ Victory Institute, where he continued to expand upon his leadership, campaign, and policy-making skills. Thank you, Preston, for joining us today. Let's all give him a warm welcome. All right, Preston, we'll turn it over to you at this point then. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me try to share my screen. We just had a little bit of an issue doing this, so. Is that working? It's working. It looks good. Great. So again, my name is Preston Parrish. I'm the State Tribal Policy Analyst with the Montana Budget and Policy Center. We're a nonprofit organization that focuses on the state budget and tax and economic policy, um, and particularly as those issues relate to Montanans living on low incomes. And, and just so folks know, I will be sure to share the slides with Dan after this. So don't worry about frantically jotting down notes. I'll be sure to send these your way. Um, so as the state tribal policy analyst at MBPC, I look at state budget decisions and tax and economic policies, particularly as they relate to tribal communities. Um, I know in advance of today's discussion, you all read two of our reports, one on the taxes that individual tribal members pay, the other on the taxes tribal governments pay. Um, and I really wanted to use those reports as a foundation for what we're going to talk about today, which is investing in indigenous futures. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot about some state fiscal policy matters and uh, the legislative session, and I'll be sure to leave time at the end for Q&A. So first we'll go through some of the tax issues in Indian country. Um, we can't talk about investments without talking about revenue. Um, we'll give an overview of the state budget, talk about why the state budget and policy matters to Indian country, go through some of the legislative session, um, and then finish off with needed policy change before Q&A. Um, and I also just want to say that I would like for this to be as informal as possible. Um, so if you have questions as we're going throughout, or if you need clarification and don't want to save a question for the end, please feel free to chime in. So for a bit of context for today's conversation, I wanted to provide you with some numbers. Um, this first one here um, is the overall American Indian Alaska Native population in the state of Montana, 67,000, which is roughly 7% of the overall state population. 
There are eight tribal nations who have a formal government to government relationship with the United States. There are seven reservations. Um, the Little Shell is based in Great Falls. That is not a reservation. Um, and then there are 11 American Indian legislators who are part of the Montana legislature. They compose the American Indian Caucus. So starting off, we'll talk about some of the tax issues in Indian country um, and what this means for tribal revenues. So a couple of key points to start off with here. Um, tax, tax revenue plays a really important role in any government's ability uh, to self-govern, to be self-sufficient. Um, and like any unit of government, tribal governments need revenue. Tax revenues help to fund government functions, programs, services, Tribal governments provide many of the same services as any other unit of government. You'll see in the graphic here that those services include education, natural resources and land management, um, the provision of health and human services, housing, really a whole range of services. Um, the thing about tribal governments is that they're providing a lot of these services but without the usual tax revenue on which other governments rely. And so the reason for that is that over time, state and local governments have successfully challenged in court the once exclusive right of tribal governments to generate revenue through taxation within the exterior boundaries of their own reservations. Um, lack of comprehensive federal Indian tax policy has allowed for this, so there is no comprehensive federal Indian tax policy. So it leaves a lot of questions around who has jurisdiction over a particular taxable activity, um, who's participating in that activity, on what land is that activity happening, um, which has a lot of consequences for tribal revenues. And I think a really important thing to acknowledge here is that taxation authority is very much at the heart of tribal sovereignty. We just talked about the fact that the ability to generate revenue through taxation um, is fundamental to a government's ability to be self-sufficient and to self-govern. And just want to acknowledge here that tribal sovereignty um, is inherent to tribal nations. It, it, it is not something something that the United States gave to tribal nations. Early interactions between settlers and tribal nations set the stage for relations today. Um, the US government continues to recognize the political and legal status of tribal nations. And despite that, state and local governments do deny tribal governments the ability to generate revenue um, by infringing upon tribal sovereignty. So going into how this has consequences for tribal governments, we'll walk through each of the revenue sources for federal government, for the federal government, the state, local governments in Montana and tribal governments in Montana. Um, the data we're about to review is the latest that we have for each of these units of government. You'll see here that um, the federal government gets most of its money by collecting taxes and borrowing. In 2019, tax revenue paid for about 80% of the federal government's $4.4 trillion budget. Um, and you'll see in the pie chart, the breakdown of that tax revenue. For the state, um, tax revenue is also a major source of revenue. Um, it is, it should be 42%, sorry about that. Um, the, the major source, the primary, the largest source of revenue for the state um, comes from transfers from the federal government. That actually changed across the past two years. It used to be tax revenue that served as the largest source of revenue for the state. Um, and you'll see that the 
tax revenue for the state is broken out there in that bullet list. So individual income taxes make up the largest share of state collected taxes, um, followed by those others. And this is included in one of the reports that you all read, but I think it's really important to reiterate this point that indigenous people pay taxes, um, pay taxes into the state, which we'll touch on why that's important later. So revenue sources for local governments in Montana, taxes are the largest source of revenue for local governments at 39%. Um, local tax revenue, you'll see there in the bulleted list, property taxes make up more than 96% of that tax revenue, um, followed by severance and other taxes, sales and excise taxes, and motor vehicle registrations. And so this chart here is pretty striking in that you'll notice none of the major revenue sources for tribal governments come from taxes. And again, this is going back to the fact that over time, state and local governments have denied tribal governments the ability to generate revenue through taxation. Um, so here, you'll see that federal funding represents the largest revenue source for tribal governments. Most of this comes from um, the federal government's trust responsibility to tribal nations in case folks are familiar with what that means. Um, so in exchange for ceding control of millions of acres of land, uh, the federal government guaranteed the continued inherent right of tribal nations to self-govern on their own lands. Um, the, self, the United States also declared tribal nations uh, to be domestic dependent nations to whom it has a trust responsibility. Um, that responsibility stems from treaties, it protects tribal lands and self-government, provides federal assistance such as healthcare and education. Um, and it's, it's meant to ensure the success of tribal communities in perpetuity. To be clear, the federal government has never fully honored this responsibility. Um, I'm sure you may have heard of the fact that the Indian Health Service budget meets just more than half of needs. So that is a woefully funded area of the federal government. Um, so without a, without a strong tax base, tribal governments outside of that federal revenue source rely on earned dollars. Um, this comes from things like tribally owned enterprises. And so the revenue sharing agreements that exist between the state and respective tribal governments um, offer a solution to some of the questions that we very briefly touched on about taxation in Indian country. So who has jurisdiction over which taxable activity, over who's participating in that activity, um, over the land where that activity is taking place. These agreements don't cover every taxable activity in the state. They largely apply to sales and excise taxes. Um, so alcohol, tobacco, natural gas. The purpose of them is to avoid legal controversy, possible lit litigation and dual taxation. So I believe in one of the reports that you all read, it touched on th this piece of dual taxation. So instances in which the state and both the tribal government have taxation authority. Um, so these are a solution, but frankly, they're also just another example of ways in which the state extracts wealth from Indian country. Um, you'll see here, I just listed out some of the distributions for fiscal year 2020 of some of these revenue sharing agreements. So for beer tax, um, it was nearly $80,000 um, of the $4.2 million in total tax revenue. So about 2% of that. And then you'll see some other examples for table wine and hard cider and then cigarette tax.
So that was just a quick overview of some of the tax considerations in Indian country. Again, we wanna talk about tax policy when we're thinking about investments because that's the revenue component that helps us to fund investments. So going into the state budget, the legislature's role here um, is to determine the size and scope of state government. Um, that's by enacting laws and funding the government um, the, the legislature specifies how to raise revenues and provides authorization for expenditures of revenues and for what purpose. And something I like to think about here is show me your budget and you show me your values. So where we invest our dollars is a reflection of our values, our priorities, and it's something that we'll talk about later in this presentation. So I'm not going to go through this entire process um, in the chart there, but that is how the state budget is made. The process starts about a year before the legislative session. Um, right now we are in the, so the, the, the house just passed the proposed state budget, um, which is somewhere in that chart. Um, but the budget is referred to as house bill two. Um, the proposed budget for the 2023 biennium, which is the budget for year fiscal year, th these next two fiscal years, um, is proposed to be $12.6 billion. For comparison, the 2021 biennium budget was $12.2 billion. Just a quick summary of what how what is included in house bill two um so there's it's made up of federal special revenue the general fund state special revenue proprietary i won't go into that um, but i have provided some definitions here in case folks are interested in looking over that later um, i do want to just acknowledge though um, the general fund so this is probably what you hear most folks talking about. The general fund is really important. Um, it's revenues from general sources. So things like property and income taxes that can be used for any purpose really, um, which is why it's so important in determining the overall level of funding that we have available. So expenditures here, this is starting to get into where we make those investments. Um, the budget is broken out into different sections. So section A is general government. Um, again, these are all just proposed numbers for this biennium. Um, section B, health and human services is by far the largest section of the budget. Um, natural resources and transportation, Section D, Judicial Law Enforcement and Justice, and Section E, Education. Um, House Bill 2 contains temporary appropriations, so that accounts for 80% of all appropriations in the state. Other appropriations include statutory appropriations. Um, those are permanent unless there's a sunset date on that appropriation or unless the legislature changes law. Um, so these include things like assistance to local governments and Medicaid expansion. So how the state budget impacts Indian country, there are three primary ways. Um, the first is through federal and state investments and in services that help all Montanans. The second is through direct state investments in Indian country. I've provided a few examples that we'll walk through later. Um, and then an allocation of federal investments by the state. So these come in the form of block grants and pass through appropriations. But then Indian country also impacts the state budget. So we've already talked about the fact that indigenous people pay taxes. Again, here is that chart that walks through in which cases folks are paying taxes. And then there's also this. So it's estimated that each year tribal nations contribute roughly $1 billion 
to the Montana economy. Um, so this comes from a Department of Commerce report that focused on data for fiscal years 2003 through 2009. So this figure represents only public sector contributions. So those contributions that tribal governments are making, this study did not include the private sector. So we could expect this $1 billion contribution to be significantly larger than it is. The 2019 legislature passed House Bill 632 to update this figure um, and for the report to include the economic impact of the private sector in tribal communities. We were hoping that that report would have been ready by the legislative session because that information is really powerful in countering the dominant narrative that indigenous people don't pay taxes, that tribal communities are not contributing to the state economy when in fact we know they are, um, we just have data data right now. So we're really hopeful that that information will be made available in the near future. Real quick, if I can interrupt, uh, if natives contribute a billion dollars, how big is the overall state uh, economic picture? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, but it would be really useful to compare whatever updated number we have from House Bill 632 to that. Um, and of course, I think we would also just want to compare against public sector contributions since that's the number we have here and I don't quite know what, what that is, but we could probably say it's something close to 12-ish billion dollars if we're just thinking about the state budget and the contributions that the state is making through that. Okay, so moving into where we're seeing some of the investments this legislative session. So the first one I'll talk about is the Indian Country Economic Development Program, more commonly called the ICED program. This program began in 2005. It aims to increase access to economic opportunities in tribal communities. Um, the three programs that are housed within the ICED program are th the Tribal Business Planning Grants, Native American Business Advisors or NABA program, Indian Equity Fund, Small Business Grants. Um, and these provide tribal governments, organizations and citizens with funding and technical assistance to carry out economic development activities. You'll see in this text box, um, a really powerful piece of information. So according to a 2018 report, 84% of Indian Equity Fund grant recipients may remain in operation after five years, whereas just 20% of small businesses nationally succeed. Um, this shows us that grant recipients are filling needed gaps in tribal communities and are providing much needed services. Um, through their small businesses. So despite this program's huge success, um, the legislature funds it and continues to fund it on a one-time only basis. That means each legislative session, it has to reauthorize the funding um, and debate that funding. In 2021, the legislature funded it at a level of $1.75 million. Again, one-time only funding, that's what the OTO means. Um, and for this biennium, it's proposed to be about $1.75 million. Again, one-time only. Um, there are efforts to move it into the base budget, meaning the legislature wouldn't have to debate it every session. Um, which really matters because when you're thinking about long-term economic development opportunities, it's tough to do that if you can't depend on certain funding streams. Um, this program I'll say is in section A of the budget. 
So that general government section that we had talked about. The next program is the Montana Indian Language Preservation Program um, or the MILP program. So this program began in 2013. It supports language preservation efforts by tribal governments. Um, you'll see in the chart there, 2015, at the top $45,000 of that bar. Um, that comes from a different language preservation program. It's the um, language immersion programs, which provide language instruction to students in school districts on or near reservations. Again, since its inception, um, the legislature has funded it on a one-time only basis. So 2021, that was a level of one and a half million dollars. Proposed funding for 2023 is one and a half million dollars. There, there was a bit of a fight um, earlier this session to keep this funding. So this program used to be housed in Section A with the Indian Country Economic Development Program. Um, but the joint subcommittee that is responsible for proposing the budget for that section um, was considering cutting it all together. So this program is now moved to Section E of the budget, um, which is the education section. Again, that's all that's proposed. Um, but that, that could make sense considering some of the language immersion efforts that we're seeing in that part of the budget. Um, rather than the Department of Commerce overseeing this program now, it would be the Office of Public Instruction. So we'll see what happens, um, but it appears that this will stay in Section E. Preston, while you're on that point, this is Dan. Um, do, do the tribes also get federal funding for the Indian language preservation work? I, I think my colleague, Rosalyn Lapierre, has been uh, working on some bills on that there. Do you know the status of that at all? I don't track federal legislation quite as much. Um, thinking about the American Rescue Plan Act, um, I think there might be some funding tied to preserving languages. Um, in tribal communities because there's, there's such an imperative to protect languages, particularly in the midst of the pandemic. Um, so tribal elders um, are, are often the speakers of languages. And as you all can imagine, the pandemic is particularly um, threatening to elders. So, there may be some, some funding in that. I, I just haven't looked too much into ARPA, um, but I'm sure there's also other funding programs if Rosalind had mentioned that. So the Tribal College Assistance Program, um, the purpose of this is to provide financial support for tribal colleges to educate resident non-beneficiary students. Non-beneficiary students are those students who are not American Indian or are who are not direct descendants. Um, you'll see in the chart here the funding discrepancies between state funding discrepancies between tribal colleges and community colleges in the state. This is on a per student basis. So for tribal colleges, current state, state law caps that funding at $3,280 per student. And as it compares to Dawson Community College, Flathead, Community Col Flathead Valley Community College, and Miles Community College, you'll notice the huge difference. So, something important to say here. So the state is not obligated to fund tribal colleges. Um, most, most funding for tribal colleges is federal, um, but 
tribal colleges are educating non-Indian students and providing a huge benefit to the state. Um, and so it makes sense that the state provide funding there. Um, the 2021 biennium budget appropriated about $2 million to this program, including one-time only funding of $350,000 for tribal colleges to administer the high step, which is a high school equivalency exam. Um, for this biennium, it's proposed at a similar level, including again, more one-time only funding of $350,000 for the high set. Um, and this is in section E of the budget. So another important bill that we saw this session that very quickly failed um, was around distributing recreational cannabis tax revenue to tribal governments. Um, this obviously is coming from I-190. So it would have distributed 8.4% of recreational cannabis tax revenue, which is estimated to be as much as $3.3 million in 2025 to tribal governments to use for the reasons that you'll see on the screen there. Um, the 8.4% is proportional to one year census estimates of American Indian Alaska native population in the state. The number I cited earlier was a five year estimate. Um, this was heard in house tax on March 24th and <laughs> immediately tabled in that hearing um, on party line votes. So the 12 to six vote. And I think one other thing to talk about here um, is that this, this probably would have been structured similarly to the revenue sharing agreements that we had talked about, um, where under House Bill 621, tribal governments would have been allocated a share of that 8.4% um, based on tribal enrollment, which is similar to how we see some of the revenue sharing agreements structured. I'm sure you all are very familiar with MMIP, um, but to give a little bit of background on it, Montana is one of the top five states for cases of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. According to a September 2020 report by the Montana DOJ, Indigenous people account for about 26% of missing persons cases. And again, Indigenous people represent a much less significant share of the state population. So a truly disproportionate impact. So in 2019, the legislature passed a package of bills to help curb MMIP rates. Um, one that I wanna draw attention to is Senate Bill 312. It created the Looping in Native Communities or LINK Network grant program um, and established a Missing Indigenous Persons Task Force. These two things have been in the news quite a bit. Um, so the bill provided a grant that Blackfeet Community College um, used to set up a, a data network. Um, one thing that's worth noting about the, the task force is that it was charged with um, looking at jurisdictional barriers, which again, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, really fuels this issue because there are so many questions around which jurisdiction has jurisdiction over a certain person on what land, what's the activity, similar to taxation. So we're also seeing a package of bills moving through the legislative session, this session. Um, there are three that are getting a lot of attention. 
One is House Bill 35, which would establish a missing persons review commission to look at closed missing persons cases. Um, it would appropriate $20,000 from the general fund to DOJ. I'll note here that that $20,000 is a reduction from the originally proposed $85,000. Not a lot of money, right? When you're thinking about a $12.6 billion budget, but for whatever reason, the legislature decided to dock it. House Bill 36, that would establish a grant program to help fund training opportunities for community-based missing persons response teams. Um, it would appropriate $61,000. And you're probably noticing that all of these are serving different purposes. So the community-based efforts um, are something that we're seeing new this session. It did not come up in 2019, but it's really important when you're thinking about a community-wide response to finding a missing person. And then House Bill 98, this would extend the termination dates of the task force and the link grant program that the 2019 legislature passed. And it would um, appropriate $50,000. Again, not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. You'll notice that the three of these combined are less than $150,000 dollars total. Um, all of these are still alive and appear to be moving to the governor's desk. So the next area that I want to talk about is property tax legislation, which might seem interesting within the context of making investments. Um, but what's interesting about this is that it, and I'll give more background, but it asks tribal governments to direct resources to property taxes that could go elsewhere. So there are a couple of bills that we're focusing on in this area, but to take a step back, so reservations were set aside um, as exclusive use for tribal nations. Um, but beginning in 1887, the federal government reneged on its obligations to protect reservations in perpetuity for tribal nations by beginning the policy of allotment. So the purpose of allotment <laughs> was to dissolve tribal governments and reservations and to assimilate indigenous people into indigenous society. That was the purpose of allotment. Because of allotment, it, it changed some of the, the status of land on reservations. And by doing so, opened some of the land to property taxation. As a result of that, a lot of reservation land moved out of tribal ownership. Um, and to be clear, a purpose of allotment was to make available land and resources, natural resources, to non-Indian settlers on reservations. And so recognizing how truly terrible that policy was, the federal government stopped it in 1934 when it passed the Indian Reorganization Act. Under the Indian Reorganization Act, it put in place a process by which tribal nations can restore some of the land taken through allotment. Fast forward to today, that process can be very time and resource intensive for tribal nations. It's also important to say here that because of allotment today, it means that tribal governments are tribally owned property, so owned by tribal governments, um, may be subject to property taxation. Keep in mind, property that's owned by the federal, state, or local governments in Montana receives an automatic property tax exemption. So not only is this 
the, these bills that we're seeing this session, not only are they possible because of deeply problematic settler colonial policy, um, it's also an inconsistent tax treatment of government. So there's an expectation that tribal governments pay property taxes when other governments are not. So in 2011, the legislature put in place a temporary tribal property tax exemption that tribal nations can apply to those efforts to restore some of their tribal lands. Um, it's good for five years and it's something that they have to apply for. So one bill we saw earlier this session was Senate Bill 138. It would have outright repealed that property tax exemption. Um, Senate tax tabled it shortly after hearing it. I'll also say that we saw the exact same bill in the 2019 session. Also, it clearly failed because it's before us again. So after having tabled Senate Bill 138, the same sponsor brought forward Senate Bill 214. Again, we saw this in the 2019 legislative session. So this bill would simply revise that temporary tribal property tax exemption. So what it would do is allow counties to capture act taxes on tribal property should either the federal government deny the application to restore that land that was taken under allotment or should that five-year exemption expire. And it's not unheard of for these applications to take longer than five years. So this passed the Senate, um, House tax heard it last week, and we expect the committee to take action on it sometime this week. Um, if it votes it out of committee, then the full house will consider it. So those are just a few of the budget decisions um, and tax and economic policy matters that we're seeing this legislative session. I wanted to talk very quickly about some of the needed change where we could see opportunities to strengthen investments in Indian country. So I've broken them out here as to who would be responsible. Um, so number one would be for the state to negotiate revenue sharing agreements to keep tax revenue in tribal communities. So right now, those revenue sharing agreements allow for the state to keep the tax of non-Indian activity. So for the alcohol tax um, or cigarette tax, the state is keeping the share of what is estimated to be non-Indian activity and the tribal governments are receiving the share of taxable activity of tribal citizens. So a very easy change for the state would be to simply renegotiate to allow for 100% of that tax revenue to stay in tribal communities. And this is, it's not absurd, right? I mean, tribal governments are not collecting taxes for taxable activity of tribal citizens off reservations. It only makes sense that the tax revenue generated in tribal communities stays in tribal communities. So that's the first proposed change. And that's administrative and does not require policy change. This other one for the state also does not require policy change. 
it simply asks the state to adequately invest in Indian country. Just earlier today, I was watching a hearing um, and one of the members who sits on the committee um, suggested that the state withhold funding for tribal communities should tribal governments not pay their fair share um, for the program that they were discussing, which is interesting. The third would be for Congress to actually legislate tribal tax primacy. So what that means is, again, we talked about there being a lack of comprehensive federal Indian tax policy, um, which has allowed for those challenges from state and local governments. What this would do is clearly articulate who has taxation authority in Indian country. Um, so answering those questions around what is the activity, who's participating in the activity, on what land. That way there aren't legal challenges to tribal governments trying to generate tax revenue to fund programs, services that benefit all Montanans. So that would be pretty sweeping legislative change. Um, it's something that's been in conversation for a while now. I have no sense for what the future of that is. Um, I do know that there are, are groups who are interested in advancing a tax policy agenda that works for Indian country at a national level. Um, but that's a pretty big lift. And with that, I will open it up to questions. I finished a few minutes earlier than I thought I would. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Preston. We'll, um, I think Savannah has the first question. And then I know there are several other people who posed questions ahead of time as well. But Savannah, why don't you get us started off? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for taking um, time out of your night to speak with us. It was very informational and I learned a lot. So thank you. Um, my question is addressing the harms of dual taxation in Indian country. I was not fully aware of the sad reality tribal governments face while collecting state taxes. If they impose a tribal government tax then the resulting dual taxation drives business away or tribes collect no taxes and suffer in accurate schools, roads, laws, law enforcement, courts, and healthcare. Including this, reservation economies funnel millions of dollars into the treasuries of state and local governments who spend money outside the reservation. It's no wonder why Indian reservations around the country experience severe cases of persistent po poverty. And this is one of the many reasons that keep reservations as the most underserved communities in the nation, and it's devastating. Do you see this dynamic changing at all in the future? If so, what can regular Montana citizens do to help create that change so that Indian reservations can start to fully take advantage of their land and resources on their own to begin to thrive on a deeper level? Yeah, that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> and it relates to, I suppose, all of those proposed changes that I had outlined on that final slide. I think the most helpful in terms of actually answering this question would be for Congress to actually legislate tribal tax primacy. So again, explicitly articulating that within the exterior boundaries of reservations, tribal governments have tax primacy or, or that their, their ability to tax supersedes the ability of any other taxing jurisdiction so that would allow for tribal governments to levy those taxes and to retain that revenue. But you touched on a really important note, right? In that years of chronic underinvestment, disinvestment, um, and, and the fact that that has so deeply limited 
infrastructure in Indian country today means that we couldn't simply legislate tribal tax primacy and expect that to solve the problem because some tribal governments simply don't have the infrastructure to levy those taxes and to collect that revenue. I think in some cases there would have to be a phase in wherein, and this, this would <laughs> ask a lot of states, but for, for states to recognize the harm they've done in extracting wealth from Indian country and in limiting access to opportunity in Indian country and doing their part to help levy those taxes, collect that revenue and redistribute it to tribal governments until tribal governments have the infrastructure in place to levy and retain and do everything else that goes into exercising their sovereign inherent right to generate revenue through taxation. It's a very, very big question. I don't think we will see, I don't think we'll see the needle move on that very much in the near term. Um, that said, there are smaller steps that states can take in the meantime. Um, that would be, again, negotiating revenue sharing agreements to keep more tax revenue in Indian country. Um, and it would also mean passing bills like House Bill 621 that simply distribute a share of tax revenue to tribal governments, even if um, that revenue isn't coming from Indian country. So there are a lot of different things to consider here, some sweeping, some smaller steps to think about in the meantime. And I don't want to be cynical, but I don't, I, I don't think we'll see much change in the very near term. Thank you. Um, Quinn, do you want to ask a question next? And then I know Ray has his hand up after Quinn. Hi, Preston. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, I find it pretty astounding, like how high the rates are. And I remember last, uh, this past fall semester, receiving some text messages and emails from the university um, just in regards to missing slash murdered uh, Indigenous women, and even the driving on the interstate, I've seen advertisements um, for missing Indigenous uh, women. So I was wondering, why is it that this is such a huge problem? And um, I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into depth about the jurisdiction that tribal communities uh, or police force and um, like local police forces like uh, have. So like, if there is a, a kidnapping in Missoula per se, Will the Missoula Police Force work with um, said person's uh, uh, <laughs> tribal home? Um, and like, yeah, also, um, uh, one moment. Uh, there was a legislation proposed to prolong how long the cases are open for these. Um, how long are the cases usually uh, stay open for missing and murdered uh, Indigenous women and girls. Do you see uh, cur currently proposed legislation a viable solution to solving this problem? So I'll, I'll do my best to answer both your questions. If I don't address them both, just let me know. Um, so yes, jurisdiction is part of the problem here. Um, there are other things that we could talk about, but I'll focus on jurisdiction. So one of the things to think about is that until recently, tribal nations had no jurisdictional authority to criminally prosecute non-Indians, even for crimes committed in Indian country. So these jurisdictional gaps protected non-Indians while compromising the safety of American Indian people. Um, that changed a little bit. Um, with passage of federal legislation. 
but it, it's still jurisdictional matters are still a big part of the problem. Um, part of that has to do with who has jurisdiction over American Indian people, who has jurisdiction over non-Indian people, where is the where is the the alleged crime? Um, where did it take place? Is it on our reservation? Is it off our reservation? Is it on reservation trust land? Is it on reservation fee land? What is the crime in question? Um, there's there's really a lot to think about with um, the jurisdictional web. It 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 really slows down the process, and some of the bills that we saw during the 2019 session attempted to get at that. And I, I can't remember which bill off the top of my head and what exactly it did, but it its purpose was to get jurisdictions to better communicate with one another in an effort to help curb these rates of disproportionately high MMIP. This isn't the most satisfying answer, um, but it's it's so, so complicated. Um, and I think until we see more change around the power of tribal nations to exercise their jurisdiction, it feels hard to, to answer that question. Um, but some of the, the work that we're seeing at the state level, unclear if it's having a huge difference on the rates, considering the legislation passed in only 2019. So it's hard to have a true sense for whether state efforts are really making a difference. In fact, that's one of the questions that we're hearing from the legislature this session, particularly as we're thinking about investing not a lot of money um, into efforts to help curb these MMIP rates. So legislators want to know, are these efforts making a difference? If so, what does that difference look like? If not, why are we investing in these programs? So there's talks about potentially doing a deeper dive into what impact these bills are having in the interim. We'll see if that happens and what that looks like, but it's a really big question and there are a lot of different issues wrapped up into this and this is going to require like sweeping systemic change. That said, the state can do things, um, counties can do things. For example, respond to a case if it's reported to you. Um, that shouldn't require legislation that just because a case didn't happen necessarily within your jurisdiction that you do nothing. Um, so there's a lot that can be done differently. I'm sorry, that's not the most satisfying. No, oh, thank you for your answer. Ray, it looks like you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, just to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, you mentioned you didn't want to be cynical, but in this case of MMIP, cynicism is act absolutely warranted. You're talking about a budget of $130,000 down from about $200,000. Tells you exactly what this legislature thinks of Native peoples and the need for uh, effective prosecution of MMIP cases. That's just kind of a statement, sorry. Uh, the question has more to do with annuities. That's the 58% of tribal uh, budgets you spoke of, I believe. A uh, couple of questions, are annuities to the tribe or to individuals or both? And are they taxable under Montana and federal uh, tax laws, the annuities themselves? So I wholeheartedly um, agree with your first statement that 
these are active choices that the legislature is making, um, which just goes back to my earlier comment about show me your budget, you show me your values, like, right? Like where we invest our dollars is a true reflection of our priorities and values. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, so in terms of, I think you were talking about the 58% the of federal revenue for tribal governments, is that right? Correct. Is that annuities or is that, is that in the form of annuities? So, so what this actually um, includes, it, it's things like funding from the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Health Service, Social Security, um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, impact aid to school districts. Um, that's largely what this is. This is the federal transfers that stem from the federal government's trust responsibility to tribal nations to provide some of these programs and services. So are annuities in addition to that? Or, or is, that, is that basically what annuities are, is under the trust uh, relationship? I guess I'm less familiar with, so annuities. Well, originally annuities came about um, basically, okay, so white colonizers wanted half the, the Great Sioux Reservation. In exchange for that, the Sioux were granted annuities, so many dollars over so many years for half of their land. Um, and that came in the form of provisions, supplies, monies, and the, the system was so corrupt back then, the, the natives got almost none of it. So I guess what I'm asking is, are, is that not a current common term then for federal money that comes to the tribes? So th this, that may be part of the 58% of revenue. We unfortunately don't have the granularity of data that we need to actually say that. Um, what we know from the reporting is that the funding that the federal government transfers to tribal nations is partly from its federal trust responsibility. Um, some of that may be annuities wrapped up in there, but unfortunately, I can't really say because I don't have access to that granular of data. Yeah. Kennedy Ann. Okay, hi. Um, I just kind of had a question about the proposed changes that you mentioned near the end. Um, as like students and citizens of Missoula, what can we do to kind of help implement them? Because I know you sounded a little bit not super hopeful after answering Savannah's question about that happening anytime soon. So I think one thing that folks can do is to make their voices heard, right? The legislature has hearings every day, all day on a number of different issues. It is not the sole responsibility of tribal leaders of tribal advocates to advocate investments in Indian country or to advocate that the state honor tribal sovereignty. There are tons of opportunities to offer public testimony to different committees on bills that matter to Indian country, right? I think specifically to House Bill 621, where anyone could have come in to say, tribal governments need revenue, it's fair, to distribute 8.4% of recreational cannabis tax revenue to tribal governments simply because it's the right thing to do. And that can go a long way. We, we need voices from outside of Indian country to say that state investments in Indian country matter. Um, we need the legislature to know that Indian country isn't the only one that cares about Indian country, that other folks in Montana want the state to do right by tribal nations. If you're uncomfortable offering public testimony, 
that's totally fine. There are still opportunities to submit written testimony. Um, that way you don't have to be in front of a committee. And that's still a really great avenue to make your voice heard. And then in terms of thinking through some of these state investments, there are opportunities early on in the budget making process to let the legislature know that you want them to prioritize investments in Indian country. So like I said, the budget making process begins about a year out from legislative session. That's an opportunity to start contacting folks and letting them know that you care about the Indian country economic development program. You care about the tribal college assistance program. You care about the Montana Indian language preservation program, that these are investments that matter to you and that they matter to Montana because Montana is stronger when Indian country is stronger. Um, and it's really important to help rewrite the existing dominant narrative that indigenous people don't pay taxes, that tribal communities are not making contributions to the overall state. There are tons of things to do um, and none of them require too much effort. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Mark has a question. Preston, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's so complicated and it's ridiculous. Tax primacy is, is, uh, would solve just a whole lot of this. And you're correct. It's hard to claim sovereignty um, when there really is none. <laughs> um, but kind of a twofold question. The thing that stood out to me in your report is uh, why the revenue sharing is only based on populations on the reservation. When appropriations come in, in federal form, they do it by the census. Um, so why wouldn't a statewide census of the population um, influence that sharing, whether they were on or off the reservation? Um, my other question um, was, are there models from the Oklahoma tribes that we could use here to actually benefit the nations in a, in a more positive fashion? Really great question. I don't know why the revenue sharing agreements don't look better than they do. <laughs> um, they certainly can be friendlier to tribes. This is simply the way that the state negotiated them with each of the tribal governments, which is a truly dissatisfying answer to say it's the way that it is. Um, we do know that they, the terms of them could be more favorable for tribal governments and that the state just allow tribal governments to keep all of the tax revenue. Um, so there are opportunities to renegotiate the terms of those. Um, so there, there's that piece. Um, and then in terms of other states we could look to that are doing better than Montana. So in terms of revenue sharing agreements, I think of one case specifically in Washington state um, where the state um, legislated that cannabis tax revenue for 100% of that revenue that's collected um, in tribal communities, tribal governments keep it. There are plenty of models like that for us to look to. Um, we just have to do it. Um, so there's that. Nevada actually also does some good things in terms of how it does its revenue sharing agreements with tribal governments. So there are plenty of models for Montana to look to. It just has to build up the will to actually want to do better by Indian country. Yeah, Jenny. Thank you. Hi, Preston, I'm Jenny. Um, I had a question. Okay, so I've grown up in Montana my whole life and there's you know, this really disgusting and inaccurate narrative regarding Native Americans of them you know, being lazy, that they don't pay their dues, that they're really reliant on the government. Um, 
And uh, I, I mean, it's frustrating when we see that there are literal systems that bar them from financial prosperity and make them be dependent on the state. So I was questioning, you know, how has this oppressive taxation system remained so hidden? Like, how did we get here? And also on the flip side of that, how do we unveil this oppressive taxation system and shift, you know, the truly repugnant um, narrative of Native Americans? Yeah, that's also a very big question, um, right? We are in the United States, we are taught things in a specific way, in a way that upholds white supremacy, white dominant culture. It is by no mistake that a dominant narrative of Indian country is that indigenous people don't pay taxes, that tribal communities live off government handouts, that's simply not true. Um, so frankly, one thing that I think collectively is our like sh shared responsibility is to do a lot of unlearning. That said, there are also opportunities for our education sim systems to do better by us, to help to dismantle white supremacy, white dominant culture, to actually tell a full story, to say that current circumstances are the way that they are because of white settler policies, because of white supremacist policies that were put in place to intentionally deny BIPOC communities from having access to opportunity. So a lot of it is unlearning. I think some of it, a lot of it also um, is like advocating change at various levels. So saying we want a more comprehensive education that tells us that history favors white supremacy and continues to do so today. And the only way that we'll see change, and this is not going to be overnight, right? This is going to be incremental, something that we chip away at. It's even something with the property tax legislation. That's a great example of this. We opponents to these bills constantly talk about the fact that these property tax bills are even possible because of policy that explicitly sought to dissolve tribal governments and reservations and assimilate indigenous people, right? There, there's no hiding that because that was the intent. But as much as we say that in these hearings, some of the legislators hear what they wanna hear, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be challenging their dominant narrative that tribal governments aren't paying taxes, which again, that's also wrong, but <laughs> it's something that we hear. So this is a very long winded way to say that one, as individuals, we have to do unlearning. We have to channel, challenge our own biases and commit ourselves to dismantling the white supremacy in which we were all raised. We also have to advocate change at a systemic level in an effort to dismantle white supremacy that intentionally by design holds back BIPOC communities. A lot of things wrapped up into that. Preston, if I could follow up on that, um, uh, this is Dan and I, we've been talking a lot in this class um, looking at critical different perspectives on Montana, Montana's history and, and trying to examine, for example, the white settler colonial model uh, here. And I'm just curious from your perspective, working with the legislature, uh, where you see places or if you see places where some of that settler colonialism is being challenged in the taxation policy, the fiscal policy, or is it being further perpetuated and even strengthened? in some of the legislation that's being proposed. 
Oh, it's absolutely being strengthened and proposed, right? We know that state fiscal policy is not race neutral. It is not inconsequential to tribal sovereignty. I mean, even look at the proposals to overhaul personal income taxes, right? To change um, the tax rates. We, we know that white wealthy Montanans disproportionately benefit from changes to the proposed changes to income taxes. Um, folks living on lower incomes are disproportionately people of color, they're disproportionately indigenous people. So those kinds of changes that we see to fiscal policy in Montana favor wealthy white Montanans. And so by, by, by passing these kinds of policies, it only further entrenches white supremacy in Montana. And I think it's a real missed opportunity of folks at the legislature to not actually like point that out, right? To, to not say, yes, this benefits wealthy Montanans, but also to challenge ourselves to say this disproportionately benefits white Montanans. Otherwise, we're treating state fiscal policy as race neutral, as inconsequential to tribal sovereignty, which we just we know that's not true. So I think in the both in both the short and long term, we just do ourselves a disservice by not actually talking about that. This, this seems to be one of those cases what you were just talking in terms of Kennedy Ann's question where, really, where tribal nations could really use allies, white allies, and also pointing that out. So the burden isn't left simply to tribal communities to point this out, but that of all fair-minded Montanans point out the, the kind of impacts that, the, that these policies are having. Um, you know, my, my, this we've been looking at several different um, aspects of the current legislature. Uh, um, we had a, a one was a conversation on what's being proposed in terms of large predators, uh, wolves and grizzly bears, so forth here. We had another talk on, on homelessness and, uh, and uh, real estate values and the impact on Montanans. And, and an interesting one last week about entrepreneurialism and opportunities on reservations versus other areas there. But in, in, in many ways to me, it feels like the this current legislature is trying to kind of go back to the 19th century in terms of attitudes towards uh, tribal peoples, towards predators, towards you know many different aspects of, uh, of Montana in that area there. And it, it feels like a, a lot of different things that have been uh, BIPOC communities, others are, are really under assault um, in this current legislature. But I don't know if you uh, share a similar perspective and I know you have a delicate position there on that, but it's, uh, um, looking at Montana from several different angles during a legislative session has been very revealing in terms of where the current legislators' priorities seem to be. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and some of the legislators don't even try to hide it, right? I mean, just today, one of the legislators said, explicitly right with like not even hiding it this is not me like reading between the lines he said maybe we should just withhold funding from tribal communities like that that's a choice and it's completely rooted in whatever narrative it, it is that this person was taught and continues to believe and now perpetuates and it's really unfortunate that he has so much power and is able to make decisions that impact all of Montana simply based off his misguided beliefs. Maybe as a closing point, we have just a couple minutes here, um, Preston. You mentioned that there are 11 American Indian legislators um, in Montana here. Do you think that they are having some impact in, in, in uh, drawing attention to these issues or do you see some signs of, of hope for um, moving in constructive directions? 
Yeah, I, I will say the Indian Caucus, Indian Caucus um, does have power. They have influence. Um, in fact, the, the Indian Caucus in Montana um, is it's the most representative um, across the country. So the 11 American Indians that serve in the Montana legislature make up a, a disproportionate share of the legislature in that the 11 of 150 represents more than 6.4% of the legislative body. Um, they do have power. They are not afraid to weigh in on issues. They very regularly come in um, as a caucus to oppose or support legislation. They draft letters of opposition. They are involved in high level negotiations. They serve in leadership roles. Um, but there's only so much you can do with the composition of this kind of legislature. I, like, I, I can't be too rosy about it because like you said, the legislature is taking some pretty awful actions that completely infringe upon tribal sovereignty that undermine tribal communities' ability to access opportunity. And again, it's all intentional. These are decisions that they actively make. So I think it's really important representation matters um, and they are constantly elevating issues on behalf of Indian country. They're elevating voices of Indian country. So that, that matters, um, but it, and I think we've talked about this a few different times today, is that it takes more than Indian country voices from Indian country to say that the state actually like needs to honor tribal sovereignty and invest in tribal communities. It's such a heavy burden for a small share of the legislative body to carry. And I'm not saying that there aren't non-Indian legislators who aren't playing a role, but frankly, they can do more. Well, Preston, I, we've reached the end of our, our evening here, and I want to thank you so much for taking this time with us. I think this is an area that I would say probably most of us had not had too much awareness about prior to here, but really, really critical to see how resources either flow into or flow out of uh, tribal communities and reservations. And uh, so I want to thank you so much for taking the time and, and really enlightening us on, on a lot of really critical issues on that. So, so. Well, thank you all for having me. This was, this was fun. Oh, great. Well, you're giving us a lot to think about. And so we really appreciate it. I wish you a good rest of your evening and uh, we will definitely be in touch. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye.